Well, good evening. Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study. I'm so excited to be here with you again tonight. Um, if you want to grab a Bible and a notebook, maybe take a, and a pen to take some notes, um, we're going to pray and then we're going to jump into Romans chapter 10. Um, again, we're going to be in Romans chapter 10 this evening. We'll touch on a couple other scriptures as time allows as well, but uh, primarily out of Romans 10 tonight. Um, Father, thank you that the entrance of your word brings light and it brings understanding. Father, I thank you uh, for your grace upon our lives, your uh, your free gift of salvation that you uh, had your son purchase for us. Father, as we dive into your word tonight, let it sink deep in our hearts. Let our roots go deep in you, Father, that we would be conformed to the image of your son, to his likeness, that we would grow up and mature into the head uh, the way the Bible says that we should. Father, I thank you that you help me to uh, clearly and concisely bring forth what it is that you have given me uh, to share with the people tonight in Jesus name. Amen. So starting in Romans 10, starting in verse number one, let me just kind of set the stage. Um, you know, Paul wrote a letter to the church at Rome and he did not write in chapter and verse. The chapter and verse is for our benefit. So it's easier for us to find um, what we're looking for. However, he did not write in chapter and verse. And so backing up into Romans nine, um, he is talking in the latter part of Romans nine starting in about verse 30, um, about unbelief, the unbelief of his fellow Israelites. Um, and so when we pick up in Romans chapter 10, he is continuing this thought. And yes, there's a reason that we are going all the way back here to, uh, to verse one and not just pulling out scripture. I think it's really important that we learn the importance of studying God's word in context, um, meaning that we are reading uh, whole portions of scripture and not just pulling out a verse here and there and allowing it to say whatever we want it to say. Um, we're not highlighter Christians. We're whole word believing Christians. And that means that we have to be able to understand the word of God in the context in which it was written. So going forward, to verse one, starting in verse one, it says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, speaking of Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant, the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own way, they did not submit to to God's righteousness for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes for Moses writes picking up in verse five for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them but the righteousness based on faith says do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down or who will descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ up from the dead but what does it say the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Verse 11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We're going to stop there in Romans 10 um, for the moment. So I want to go all the way back um, to the beginning of chapter 10. And I just kind of want to lay this out for you. So Paul says that it's his heart's desire to see his people, the children of Israel, come to salvation in Jesus. And he commends them that they have a zeal for God, but it's not a zeal that comes from knowledge of who God is. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about the times um, that they lived in. Um, they had synagogues and in the synagogues, they had religious laws that they were bound to fulfill, not understanding that Jesus came as the fulfillment of the law. He came as fulfillment of the Torah and the prophets. And not understanding that he had come that way. They had zeal for God. They had religious fervor for God. But they did not have a zeal that came with the understanding that Christ was the Messiah who came as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world in order to put them in relationship with God the Father, thereby fulfilling the law and all of its religious requirements. And then he goes on to talk about how Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law and how you, you have to you know, do the law. And then Paul goes on to express what the gospel message is. It's the message of salvation to all. The confession of your mouth that Jesus is Lord. The belief in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That is is what lends itself to what we call salvation. And then in verse 10, he says, for with the heart one believes and is justified. That word justified is just as if I had never sinned. That's what Jesus did. He bore all of the sin of the world, past, present, future, so that I and you could have relationship with a holy God. And so the through salvation, we are justified just as if I had never sinned. And then with the mouth, we confess and are saved. What do we confess? We confess our need for a savior. We confess our need for a relationship with God, the father, recognizing that it's through his son that our identity, it's that in Christ reality we've been talking about, that his son paid the price that we could never begin to pay. To put us back into relationship with a father, God, who created us, 
because he wanted relationship. Everyone who believes in him is not put to shame. And then he goes on to say that there's not a distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. In other words, he's saying if the children of Israel, if his fellow Israelites would recognize that Jesus was the Messiah and the fulfillment of the law and get out of religion and into relationship then their God is the same God that we Gentiles serve. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The salvation is the gift for everyone. So jumping down then into verse 14, he says, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So we see this progression where it starts with how do they know to call on him in whom they don't know to believe in? And how do they believe if they've never heard? And how, how are they to hear unless someone tells them? And how is someone to tell them unless they're sent? So we have to understand that, you know, when the world acts crazy, when those who are not in Christ act crazy, they're just acting according to their natural nature, which is the sin nature because they haven't been recreated, made anew, transformed. They haven't had that second Corinthians 517 moment where if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation and the old is gone and the new is come. So the message of salvation is the message to all. It's not just to the ones who are sitting inside the church walls. It's the message to all, to every man and we're commissioned. Jesus told his disciples, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news. Baptizing them in the name of the father. Making disciples. So we have a part to play in this. But then it says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So faith comes because we hear something, we acknowledge it as truth, and we believe it. And that hearing should be the word of Christ, the gospel. That's how we come to salvation. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, let's talk for a moment about what faith is. Go with me, if you can, in your Bible to Hebrews 11, which is known as the faith chapter. The author of Hebrews dedicated a whole chapter in his or a whole section in the letter he wrote to the Jewish people, the Hebrews On faith and starting in verse one, it says this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not yet seen for if for by it, the people of old receive their commendation by faith. We understand that the universe was created by the word of God 
so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Let me just stop right there. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction or the King James Version, I believe, says it's the evidence of things not yet seen. So the other uh, week I was out to dinner with uh, one of my spiritual kids and um, we were in the restaurant and she quoted a a, a scripture out of James um, chapter two, faith without works is dead. And she just quoted that portion of the scripture. Now, I'm a big context person. You can't just take that scripture and rip it out of its context and really understand what it's saying. And so as we're sitting there in the restaurant, I actually did not have my physical Bible in the restaurant with us. Um, And so I pulled up on my phone the Bible app I use um, and went to James and backed all the way up to James chapter 1 where James talks about being a doer of the word and not a hearer only deceiving yourself. In other words, when we hear the word, there's supposed to be a corresponding response to the word that we hear. And if you've been around the church, um, any church, um, for more than a nanosecond, you have probably heard a message or two on faith. But I started all the way back in James 1 and read through in the context in which James was writing his letter to believers. And then I, I took her to this portion of Hebrews 11, where it says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, we just read in Romans 10, the, the last piece of, of, of that portion of scripture that we read in Romans 10 says, now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But here in Hebrews 11, in this first three verses, it says faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So faith is tethered to hope. And it's the evidence of things that we don't see. So I said to her um, in the restaurant, I said, when you came in the restaurant and they brought you to the booth, did you have to have faith to sit down on the bench that that bench was going to hold you? And she laughed and she said, no. And I said, right. Right. Because your natural senses tell you that that bench is sturdy enough to hold you. Tonight, if I were to grab a chair and sit down in it, I wouldn't need faith to sit in the chair. Because I can see with my natural eye that that chair is sturdy enough to hold me. So faith is not about your five senses, what you can see, feel, hear, smell, or taste. In fact, the author of Hebrews says it's the evidence of things not yet seen. And then in verse three, 
He says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are invisible or excuse me, of things that are visible. Genesis one and verse one says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void Let's go to Genesis 1. I don't like to quote scripture. I'd rather read it. So let's go to Genesis 1. See it with your eyes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And if you continue reading in Genesis 1, you will see that God says, And then it's formed. For everything else that happens in the six days of creation. You might be like, well, where are you going with this? There was a corresponding action that brought the world into existence. What was the action? God spoke. God said. He created the world, the universe, by his words. Now, You've heard me talk a lot about God's original intent, right? Which was Genesis 1, when he created man, God's original intent. God said, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our likeness, in our image. Our Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So if God had to speak in order to create, why do we think that things are just going to fall on us like ripe cherries? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. There has to be a corresponding action. Why do I say that? Go with me to Mark 11. And starting... In verse 20, well, let me back up, go to verse 12, because I want to make sure we get this in context. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he, speaking of Jesus, was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, jump to verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. The fig tree that Jesus cursed the day before is now withered 
to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. The original um, Greek there says, have the faith of God. Or in other words, have the God kind of faith. Truly I say to you, verse 23, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So Jesus tells his disciples they have to have the faith of God or the God kind of faith. And then he tells them you have to say, not doubt and believe that what you said holds the power to bring into the physical realm what you cannot yet see with your five senses, what is not already existing in the natural. Think about that for a second. God created the universe by his words. He created man in Genesis 1 26 in the likeness and image of father, son, Holy ghost. So why would we think that faith is going to work any other way. If God had to speak it for the world to be formed, then we have to speak what is not already in existence into existence. We have to pull it out of the invisible into the manifestation in the natural. So, that's how faith works. Jumping back to Hebrews 11 and verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Verse six, and without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So. I'm, I'm having this conversation with my, my spiritual daughter and, you know, about James chapter two, where it says, uh, without faith, uh, faith without works is dead. And I'm having this conversation with her. Um, and again, I'm a real big context person and James one, um, verse 19 is where I started with her. 
which talks about every person being quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. When I read that, I hear that everything I do, everything I say, I have to be in faith, utilizing faith, putting into action my faith by speaking forth into the the natural realm that I walk in, speaking forth into the natural what has not yet manifested itself and in that process of speaking and saying it i have to mix hope with that and i have to mix belief with that let's be real honest if you don't believe that it's god's will to heal your body the next time you get sick, are you by faith speaking forth healing? No. If you don't know that you know that you know that it is God's will for you to be well, you're not speaking that forth the next time you get sick. But I'm persuaded, cannot be moved off of it, that it is God's will. It is in the scripture that he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, I am healed. And if I believe that. And I speak that the next time something tries to come on me and I don't let off the gas just because it doesn't instantaneously manifest itself. That's the other thing. We got to quit giving up so easy. We have to quit giving up so easy. We have to keep our foot on the gas holding fast to what we say we believe that's the corresponding action that's what it looks like to be a doer and it's not because Jesus is a vending machine and we just press the button and instantaneously it manifests sometimes you'll notice in the gospels it was as people went that they were made whole and then there were other times that it was instantaneous but the key component is if you don't receive what you've asked for by faith instantaneously You've got to make sure your words, what is coming out of your mouth, is mixed with faith. And you're not speaking the opposite of what you just prayed for. Brother Hagen, when I was out at uh, Rama, I remember him sharing the story about how there was um, a couple in his church while he was pastoring um, before he went on the road. Um, there was a couple in his church and um, they were in financial straits. And uh, they um, 
came to to Brother Hagen and, you know, basically they were like, we don't have money to, to keep the phone on, you know, we don't have money to keep the phone on. And uh, so he did what Brother Hagen does and he, he taught them concerning finances and, and, and that it's God's will to provide for our needs. And he said, but if you're going to get on the f- uh, phone later today and tell three people you ain't got no money, he said, there's no point in even praying because it's not mixed with faith. It's not mixed with belief that God has the ability to provide for what you have need of. We have to mix Well, and I mean, Jesus said in Matthew six, uh, six, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what you truly believe is, is what comes out of your mouth. So how do we adjust and alter when we don't have faith for the thing that we need to have faith for? for the circumstance that we're walking through. How do we adjust and alter what truly we believe in our hearts? Well, we do that through the renewing of our mind and and allowing that revelation and the renewal of our mind to sink down into our spirit man to what we say What comes out of us truly is our core belief. You can't move me off of the fact that God heals. Real quick story, and it's going to be, that's how we're going to end tonight, is I'm going to just share a personal, uh, personal testimony. So a few years ago, we all lived through COVID, right? Um, And... When it hit in 2020, um, you know, every day I would find myself thanking the Lord that I was dwelling in the secret place. And because I was dwelling in the secret place, no harm could come nigh my dwelling. No sickness. If it didn't come from heaven, it couldn't exist inside of me. And um, those were, you know, pretty much my my day to day confession of faith. Um, I, I continued to work through the pandemic, interacting with the public, with what I do for a living and, and all of that. Um, and so anyway, in 2021, um, just about a week ahead of, uh, Thanksgiving, I left work one day, not feeling well, and I felt kind of fluish to be honest um, and it was odd because I don't get the flu. Um, and it felt, um, not great. Anyway, long story short, um, within the first six and a half hours of being at home, I realized I probably had somehow come in contact with the virus that was COVID. And, um, so knowing, you know, you have to get tested and all that jazz. I, I, I call, you know, I, I made an appointment to have a virtual well visit with my doctor and, and get the order to go get tested and all of that. So anyway, it came back positive. Of course, I at that juncture already recognized that I was carrying the virus. My body was fighting the virus. And so anyway, we're a couple of days into this. I'm pretty much had been running a fever consistently when I was awake. Um, I was listening to the word of God 
I was listening to solid teaching. Um, I was listening to the word. Um, I couldn't read for very long. I just didn't have the energy um, to to do that. Um, but I was listening with every waking moment um, to the word. And um, anyway, I developed a pain in my chest just above my heart. And it was like a pretty strong pressing pain. And I was like, what is this? Like, where is it coming from? What is this? Um, and so like, you know, I would massage the area above my heart. And, um, anyway, when the doctor called to finally tell me what my results of my COVID test were, which was a positive COVID test, um, I expressed to her that I was having this pain above my heart in my chest. And her immediate response was, you need to get to the hospital because this virus attacks the heart. And I'm like, what? And she said, you need to get to the hospital. So anyway, long story short, I end up going to the hospital, um, into the emergency room. Um, and um, I tell them, you know, what's going on, why I'm there. Um, doctor gives me a lecture about not taking the vaccine and um, gives me a lecture on, you know, it's probably inflammation and I should take some Advil to help manage the pain and heating pad to, you know, help provide comfort um, and sent me home. And so I get home. I don't have any Advil in my house. I don't even keep Tylenol in the regular. We just don't do it because I don't tend to need those things. And so um, I, I, I didn't have any Advil. So I can remember texting my son, telling him, hey, I need some Advil, according to the doctor. Um, and uh, can you pick some up on the way home and drop it at my door? And, um, so anyway, the Advil gets there. Um, I take it into my bedroom and I set it down and I just had this really strong check in my spirit about taking this Advil. Mind you, I'd been doing the heating pad thing pretty much all afternoon after getting home from the hospital and I wasn't feeling great. Um, just really struggling with, uh, this pain, this discomfort, I couldn't get comfortable when I was laying down and I wasn't even able to lay down fully anyway because I couldn't breathe when I did that. So it was just this thing. So anyway, um, I'm like, have this really strong check in my spirit about Advil and not taking this. So I set it on my, my dresser in my bedroom and I lay back down with the heating pad and I finally fall into a pretty deep sleep. And about one o'clock in the morning, I wake up and I wake up and I am in such discomfort. Um, again, right above my heart in such discomfort, I wake up and I'm like, what is up with this? So I try to reposition myself in bed and I'm not comfortable. So I decide that I'm going to get up. I look over. And I see the Advil on the dresser and I have this same check in my spirit. And I'm like, okay, well, Lord, if you're checking me on taking this Advil, I'm not taking the Advil. And so I began to walk in my bedroom. Now, I had already prayed, proclaimed that by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. I was believing for wholeness and healing. It did not miraculously, instantaneously manifest itself for me. This was a process. And so I'm walking back and forth in my bedroom and I just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. And as I'm walking, I'm massaging the area above my heart that is hurting and causing me pain. And I'm walking back and forth and I'm walking and walking and walking. And I don't know, I didn't walk for very long because honestly, I, I didn't have the physical strength to walk for very long. Um, and so I didn't walk for very long, but I was praying in the Holy Ghost and um, I I laid down once I reached the point where I couldn't walk anymore. I laid back down in my bed and the moment that I laid down, the pain lifted and went away 
and it did not return for the rest of the time that I was working on getting better um, and the Lord was working in my body to make me well. Why am I sharing this? I truly believe I discovered after the fact, I don't know, probably five, seven days after all of this, that had I taken the Advil, it probably would have killed me because Advil interacted in a not positive way with the virus. So listen to the Holy Ghost and the heating of the Holy Ghost and turn the switch of faith on and keep it on. Keep your foot on the gas. Confessing that you are well if you're sick. And it's not that we don't go get medical attention when we need medical attention. That's not what I said. But we have to partner with the Holy Spirit with what we believe and what we learn and what we believe comes from the place of learning and reading the word of God, knowing it for the truth that it is, letting it be revelation on the inside of us that we draw on and speak forth in the moment that we need for the circumstance and situation that we face. What's the action of faith? It's what we speak. With, with words, God created the universe. What's Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24 tell us? That we have to speak what we believe. And that is the action of faith. So whatever you're going through today, Whatever you might be experiencing, if it's in the element, uh, in the environment of not feeling well, sickness, disease, whatever it is, if it's a lack of finances, whatever it is, one, get to know the scriptures that speak concerning your problem, and two, believe and speak into existence that which is not in the natural evident by your five senses speak it into existence and then keep your foot on the accelerator every time you're tempted to say something opposite of what you prayed and asked for stop yourself and speak what you truly believe Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you that the entrance of your word brings light and it brings understanding. Father, I thank you that you have everything that we need as it pertains to how we live and how we conduct life is found in your word. And so, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to dig into your word. Lord, I pray for those under the sound of my voice. Father, whatever circumstance they might be going through, Lord, I thank you that they partner with you in it. They partner with you in it, mixing faith with what they say and believe, calling into existence the thing that be not as though it were. Father, I thank you that you illuminate this revelation to your people in Jesus name. Amen.